Morning, everybody. Great to see you. My name is John. I get to serve as the executive pastor here at Peace Church. Great to have you here to worship with us. It's my privilege to get to bring God's word to us. If you've got a Bible, would you please grab it and open with me to Luke chapter 12. We're going to look at it. Luke chapter 12, verses 8 through 12 this morning. The series that we've been walking through uh, this month of October is called Haunting, the words of Jesus that scare us. In the month of October, around Halloween season, I know all of us like to get a little scared. And as Christians, we know that in the Bible, Jesus not only has some comforting, encouraging, kind things to say, he also has some frightening things to say. I think in a lot of ways, the words of Jesus are like a bowl of candy in which uh, sometimes you pull out a piece of chocolate that is sweet and you pop it in your mouth and it melts in your mouth and it puts a smile on your face. But then there are, there are also those hard sayings of Jesus that are like a jawbreaker. That you reach in, you pull it out, you pop it in your mouth, and if you try to just bite down in an instant, you're going to break your teeth. Instead, these words need to be savored, chewed, mulled over, slowly digested. We need to take some of these harder, frightening words of Jesus and chew on them until we really understand what they are saying to us and how they are calling us to follow Jesus more closely. So today, we're looking at one of those hard words. It's called the unforgivable sin in Luke chapter 12. Now, some of you are already thinking, good one, Pastor John. There's no unforgivable sin. That's not a thing. Jesus forgives sin. Well, we're going to take a look at what Jesus has to say himself in Luke chapter 12, and we'll see what we find. Look with me at Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 8. Let's read. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man also will acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. This is God's word. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, we thank you for your word this morning. We pray that you would open up our hearts to hear it, to receive it, to be challenged, convicted, and encouraged. God, I pray that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit to preach your word as a broken instrument, preaching to your people. Pray that you would be glorified. Pray that your people would be built up and all of us would grow in our walk with Jesus. We pray this all in his powerful and precious name. Amen. Amen. All right, well, hey, we're going to look at this hard saying in three parts, all right? So let's get started in part number one. First point I think that uh, the text has for us to see is that forgiveness is not God's job. I think one of the key differences between us who are hearing this word and those who were hearing this word originally when Jesus spoke it to his original audience, ancient people, uh, even the Jewish people he, he was speaking to, uh, they uh, had a very different perspective on grace and forgiveness than I think we do. It was not uncommon for them to think of sacrifices being made in order to get forgiveness for sin. Right? The Jews were used to sacrifices being made every single day in order to cover sin. And ancient religious people, pagan people outside of the Jews, they were used to this idea that the gods were angry and we had to do stuff. We had to sacrifice animals or do things in order to, to make them happier. And I think there's a big difference between the context in which Jesus originally preached this and us today. Whereas they expected something to happen in order to get forgiveness for sins, I think you and I sort of have this sense that we're entitled to grace. That it's our right that we deserve to be forgiven for our sins. Prime example is a man named Heinrich Hein. In the 1860s, he was a German poet, journalist, author. And uh, on his deathbed, the story goes that a pastor came to him to preach the gospel one last time before he passed away. And in the midst of this gospel presentation that this pastor brings to this man, he asks him at the conclusion, Sir, do you think God will forgive you when you stand before him? And Heinrich Hein's response was, of course God will forgive me. That's his job. What a perspective, huh? And I think in so many ways that is the modern contemporary perspective on how God operates. I think we have a fairly cheap view of God 
People don't think of him as just, holy, almighty. I think we think of him more as an old man passing out Werther's originals, right? Aw, oh, you did something bad. That's okay. Here, have a treat. Make it all better. Maybe he's got the, the fleece sweater on, the khakis, a little bit like Mr. Rogers or something like that. And yet the Bible gives us a different perspective on Jesus. Instead of the perspective that uh, I think my kids often have on their mom, unfortunately, they often have this in their heads, this same idea that it's mom's job to take care of me. We've got four kids, and I think, I don't remember the first two saying this out loud. We didn't get this out loud until number three. But uh, when she tells our son, our third kid, hey, clean up your toys, I've actually heard him say out loud, but mom, that's your job. I know we all think it, but he said it out loud. <laughs> That's the difference. So I think we bring this perspective to how we think about God. And yet the Bible tells us something different. Romans chapter 3 tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 6 tells us that the wages of sin is death. That what God actually owes us, what we deserve, what we're entitled to is punishment, is justice not grace. I think one of the reasons that people today have such a cheap view of God is that they don't have a healthy fear of God. I think you have to have a healthy respect for God's power, a sense of his gravity before you can really appreciate his grace. Uh, all growing up as a kid, I used to love the water, I used to love uh, swimming and tubing and fishing and all that kind of stuff. I used to think the water was a lot of fun, just a great place to be. And it wasn't until I was uh, maybe 12, 13 years old that I also grasped the sense of how frightening the water could also be. I can think of two specific times that this came to my mind. One was uh, when I was playing King of the Raft with some, some older kids. And I remember uh, uh, somebody was so determined to be King of the Raft that they held me underwater for a while so that I couldn't beat them. And I remember it finally occurring to me that not only was water fun, but water could actually kill me. That could be the end. Another time was when I was out on Lake Michigan with my dad fishing, the big lake, and uh, every once in a while we had a time when a big storm would come up and we didn't expect it, and I got to see white caps, and I got to see the wind and the waves and what water could really do. And I went from, on the one hand, thinking of water as fun and neat to having more of a realistic sense of its power and majesty. I learned to hold those two things in tension my love for the water and my respect for the water. And I think in so many ways, that's what you and I need to have towards God. God's grace is not simply neat. It is awe-inspiring that the God of the universe would forgive human beings of their sin. Take a look at the text with me. Verse 8 tells us this, that Jesus offers to acknowledge us before men. Everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man also will acknowledge before the angels of God. If we simply say, Jesus, you're my Lord and Savior and I trust you, Jesus says, he will acknowledge us before the angels of heaven. Take a look at verse 10. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. We're going to get to the second half of that sentence in just a moment, but just think about that. Jesus says, you can speak a word against me and still be forgiven. That is astonishing. That's amazing grace. I think you and I take this for granted. I think before we talk about the unforgivable sin, I think we have to have in mind a perspective that says it is amazing that there is any such thing as a forgiven sin. Let me ask you this question this morning. What are you more shocked by? That there is an unforgivable sin or that God forgives any of your sin? I think this is the perspective that we have to bring to this text this morning. It is amazing that God would forgive any of our sins. This is the perspective that we have to come to God's word with this, this morning. Are we astonished? Are we amazed by the cross of Jesus Christ? Are we amazed that the God of the universe would come and would die to take away sin? So that's point number one. Forgiveness is not God's job. It's his incredible sacrificial gift for you and I. Number two, the very heart of this passage is a warning from Jesus. And it's a warning that sin is not something to fool around with. Take a look at verse 10 
with me. Everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. So if that's the first time that you're hearing this, that might, that might strike you as startling, that might strike you as harsh, but I think we've got to put it in context of many other warning passages that are in the Bible. Let me just give you a few. The, the Bible has several things to say to us about hard hearts, about sin, and about its seriousness. Take a look at 1 John chapter 4. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. The Bible calls us out on our hypocrisy. If we say one thing and yet do another, the Bible calls us hypocrites. It says that we're in a dangerous place. Hebrews chapter 10 says this, if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Okay, so if we, if we say, I've heard the good news of the gospel, I've received Jesus, and yet we say, I don't care about sin, I'm going to go on sinning deliberately, willfully against God's commands, then there is no longer a sacrifice for sin, but instead a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which, by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. One more for you. Hebrews chapter 3. As the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice... Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. Anybody got these verses written on their living room wall? (laughs) Necklace, wristband, life verse, underline it, highlight it in your your kids' Bibles when you give them their first Bible? No, not so much? Probably not. All right, these are some of those verses of the Bible that frighten us a bit. So there's plenty of warnings in the Bible about a hard heart, about sin, and this leaves us with a few questions. Question, does the Bible contradict itself? Since other passages talk about forgiveness for any sin, I think, for example, of 1 John 1, 9. Question, is it possible to commit a sin that you can't be forgiven of no matter how much you might want to be? Question, what exactly is this unforgivable sin? Let's start with that last one. In order to answer that question, what is the unforgivable sin, I think we've got to look further at the context. You guys know that Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the first four books of the New Testament, are all called Gospels. They're the story of Jesus and what he did and said on the earth. And uh, each of them gives us a little bit of different perspective on Jesus and what he did. And so we're going to look uh, at Mark. Mark chapter 3 actually gives us a little bit more detail about the surrounding context of this saying of Jesus. Here, let's hear it. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed by Beelzebul. So the uh, religious leaders of the day are saying that Jesus is possessed by a demon. And that's how he's doing the miraculous things that he's doing. And by the prince of demons, he casts out demons. Jesus responds, truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying he has an unclean spirit. All right, so that sheds a little bit more light on the context, right? Religious leaders accusing Jesus of actually doing miracles by the power of Satan is some of the context. Let's, uh, I'm going to bring out uh, the heavy hitter here, and uh, we're going to take a look at a Bible scholar, Bible scholar Wayne Grudem, and hear what he has to say about what the unforgivable sin is. He says it includes three things. A clear knowledge of who Christ is and of the power of the Holy Spirit working through him. Two, a willful rejection of the facts about Christ that his opponents knew to be true. Three, slanderously attributing the work of the Holy Spirit in Christ to the power of Satan. You saw those three things in the text that we just looked at. Let me summarize. Let me summarize. Here's how he says it. In this case, it is not that the sin itself is so horrible that it could not be covered by Christ's redemptive work, but rather that the sinner's hardened heart puts him or her beyond the reach of God's ordinary means of bringing forgiveness through repentance and trust in Christ for salvation. So you hear what he's saying. This is a person who has heard the truth. This is the person who has seen evidence of the truth. This is a person who sort of knows that it's true, and yet 
they reject it and even attribute it to somebody else. He makes it clear that there's no sin that is so bad that the blood of Jesus can't cover it. That's not the point of this passage. The point is to say that a person's heart can become so hard that they are no longer open to hearing the truth and receiving the truth. In fact, they have rejected it entirely. I think of uh, in my own home, we've, uh, one of the things that my wife does a lot is uh, bake bread. This was freshly made yesterday. I'm going to get to enjoy this this afternoon, so nobody come up here and touch it. Uh, this is a, a beautiful homemade loaf of bread, and I don't know a ton about how making bread works, but my wife tells me that the way that this bread goes from being a flat sort of cake of flour to being a risen thing like that, that you can knock on and hear the hollowness in it, is yeast. Apparently yeast is that thing that goes into it, and it makes it rise. Now, imagine if I said, no, 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 no. I have heard that yeast is what makes bread rise. I have seen with my eyes many times in my house the bowl of flour rise up when the yeast is put into it. But I reject that idea. I actually think that it is sugar that makes bread rise. That's a little bit like what's going on here. Heard the truth, seen evidence of the truth, in a sense know that it's true, and yet reject it and say, that's Satan's work. I don't believe that. I reject that. Makes me think of 1 John chapter 1. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So you hear the two sides of what John is saying, right? In the middle there, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. The author John is saying that Jesus forgives sin that we confess. If you come to the Lord and say, Jesus, I trust you as my Lord and Savior, and I know that I have sinned. I have sinned. I confess it, and I lay it before you, and I want your forgiveness. Jesus forgives those sins. But you see the verses around it say that the person who claims that they have no sin, the person who says, I have not sinned, they can't receive forgiveness because they won't admit that they need it. They say, Jesus, I don't have any sin. I haven't done anything wrong. I don't need any forgiveness. And what Jesus says in response is, if you come with a humble, repentant heart, forgiveness you will receive. But if you claim to have no sin, then you have rejected the forgiveness that I, that I offer. Let me, uh, let me answer a question that I think is in many of our minds. If you've been tracking and following this, I think... There's a question that probably lingers in your mind, a heartfelt personal concern for somebody that you can kind of imagine. The question is this, is there such a person as somebody who desperately wants to be forgiven but cannot be forgiven because they've committed the unforgivable sin? As I look at the text and as I think about all the things that we just talked about, all the things that we just said, I think the answer is plainly no. No. Jesus said, if, if, if you want forgiveness, if you confess your sins, come to me and you'll receive forgiveness. So if the person wants forgiveness and is willing to say that they have sin in their lives, Jesus offers forgiveness. The problem is, is that the person who is committing the unforgivable sin is somebody who has no desire for forgiveness, right? They say, I don't care about sin. I don't care about God's law. I don't need forgiveness from anybody because I don't have any sin in my life. I haven't done anything wrong. I don't care about God and his law and what he says. I have no interest in those things. I think it's a plain sign that you have not committed the unforgivable sin if you want forgiveness. Your heart is not so hard if you're saying, I know that I've sinned and I want Jesus' forgiveness. I think that clearly puts you not in the category of somebody who's committed this sin. And I think some of you in the room just took a sigh of relief, right? I hope that that does bring relief to some of you. If you are worried about whether you've committed the unforgivable sin, then I think that's probably a really good sign that you haven't done so. But I also want to make sure that we hear the warning that Jesus has for us this morning. The whole warning that I think Jesus wants to give us in this passage is that sin is not something to fool around with. That living in continual sin 
unrepentant sin leads to a hard heart. It leads to a heart that is less and less desire for the things of God. To use an example from human life, I think, think of a husband or a wife who's having an affair, right? They're cheating on their spouse. I sort of imagine that that person has less and less desire for their spouse. The heart becomes harder and harder, right? They've engaged in a different relationship that is sort of fulfilling those desires, and they have less and less desire for their actual spouse until, in fact, the marriage actually falls apart. The human heart grows harder the further you go into the route of sin. Uh, I once heard a pastor illustrate it this way. He said, this is going to be a little gross, but this is, uh, he, went, he said there's a, a dead animal on a floating ice chunk headed down a river towards a waterfall. And a buzzard circling above descends on this uh, dead animal to eat it. And the buzzard is nibbling away on this dead animal's corpse and the waterfall is approaching, but the, the buzzard says, I can have just a little more. I can have just a little more. This is so good. This is filling my desires. I want this. I know that there's doom out there somewhere. It's coming, but I can have just a little more. Until finally, over the edge, the ice chunk flows and it becomes too late. Like in the same way, the human heart that continues in sin without confessing and bringing it to Jesus, becomes harder and harder and harder until one day without realizing it, suddenly it has become too late. Brothers and sisters, if you realize this morning that you are fooling around with sin and you think that you can have just a little more, just, just a little more, I can go just a little longer before turning away from my sin. Someday, I'll have to turn to Jesus, but I can go just a little more, a little longer. Be careful. Your heart may grow hard before you realize it. This brings me to the third point in our passages this morning. Come to Jesus before it is too late. Come to Jesus before it is too late. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the story of David and Bathsheba. Even if you haven't spent a whole lot of time in church, you probably heard that story, King David. One of the things that I am amazed by as I, as I look at that story, and I've heard it many times, I've read it many times, I've thought about it a, a lot, and one of the things that I am increasingly amazed by is the level of deviousness that this great man David has to go to in the course of this story. It's one thing that David is up on the roof and he sees a beautiful woman and he wants her. We can see how that would happen. But then he takes steps. He calls his servant over and he says, see her down there? Go to her, bring her here. Servant goes, brings the woman here. Woman shows up on his doorstep. David has to be fairly charming, I assume. Seduces the woman. Some time goes by, he finds out that she was pregnant. He tries to make it look like her husband did it. It doesn't work. David sits down to formulate a strategic military maneuver to kill one of his own men. Uriah the Hittite is actually one of David's mighty men, one of his greatest warriors. This is not an easy task. David calls over another servant, gets pen, gets paper, writes out a letter to Joab the general. General, I need you to kill one of our men, one of our own men, aligns the military maneuver. It happens. Word gets sent back. We assume military funeral ensues, David being the king, this being one of his greatest soldiers. I think it's highly likely that David is maybe even involved in, maybe gives the message at the funeral, maybe has to give speeches, maybe has to give condolence calls to family members. And then afterwards, David coordinates marriage to the widow. It's amazing to think about this great man, David, taking each of those steps. I sort of think that David at the beginning, David who stands on the roof, was perhaps not even capable of such heinous crimes. And yet, one step at a time, 
David's heart becomes harder. David's heart grows colder. David's heart grows darker until suddenly it is numb and frozen to the point where he has no more fear of doing what he knows to be wrong. We know how the story ends with Nathan the prophet, but let's not miss this precarious place that David finds himself in. Continuing in sin without repentance leads one step at a time towards death. If you are living in this situation this morning, if you're walking in sin and you're not confessing it to the Lord, to a Christian brother or sister, hear the warning the scripture has for us. I want to invite you to have a Nathan moment with me. I want to invite you to have a wake-up call. Nathan the prophet eventually comes to David and lays out the story of what happened and David is outraged and Nathan the prophet points the finger and he says, this was you. You've done this thing. You've committed this sin. And I think it's a miracle of God that David responds. It's a miracle that God sends Nathan and that David responds, that his heart is not so hard that he actually hears the word and he responds to it. This is you this morning. Hear the wake-up call that God is giving. 1 John 1, 9 If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus is here offering forgiveness. Whatever this sin is, the other people around you might not have any idea is happening or is in your life. Jesus offers forgiveness to those who would confess and turn to him. David himself paints the picture for us in Psalm 51 of what this turning, what this repentance can look like. Psalm 51, we have written in Scripture when it occurred, when King David wrote this song. To the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. David prays, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. This is the sinner's prayer. This is the prayer of somebody who recognizes that I have sin in my life and I need a Savior. Brothers and sisters, this is the prayer that you and I can offer and receive forgiveness. It is good news this morning that Jesus died for sin. David, penning this psalm, Psalm 51, David didn't know what it was going to look like when the Son of God would come. He didn't know that Jesus was going to live the life of perfection that you and I couldn't live. He didn't know that Jesus was going to die the death for sin that you and I deserve to die. And he didn't know that Jesus was going to rise to new life so that we could have new life too when we put our faith in him. But he has done those things. You and I know about the cross. You and I know about the blood of Jesus. And all you and I have to do is ask. It's good news, amen? Amen. Let me close in prayer for us. Father in heaven, Father in heaven, we are so thankful for Jesus Christ, your son, and his amazing grace that though we have sinned against you, he came and he died for us to take away our sin. God, we thank you for this. And God, I pray for all of us who are hearing your word this morning. I pray that you would convict us of our sin, and turn us toward Jesus. Pray that you would soften our hearts. Pray that you would unthaw, unfreeze our hearts. Turn us to Jesus. And it's in his precious and powerful name we pray this morning. Amen.